Hello and welcome to the Swine Disease Reporting System. This is the report number 50. It's a special edition for us here at the SDRS. We are celebrating the, the 50th edition uh, of the report. Uh, my name is Edison Magalhães here at Iowa State University. Hello, my name is Giovanni Trevis. I'm here at Iowa State University. Hello, Daniel Linhares, also at Iowa State. And like I said, it's a special edition for us of the SDRS, and we invited four uh, invited guests. Dr. Brigitte Mason, she's a field veterinarian at the Country View Family Farms. Uh, Dr. Tara Donovan, uh, she leads the health assurance team at the Hanor Company. Dr. Paul Yeski, he's a senior member of the veterinary team at the Swine Vet Center. And Dr. Phil Gauger, uh, he's the section leader of the Molecular Diagnostics Division of the ISU VDL. Uh, so we prepared this the, this special edition for you guys where we, we, we're going to have a discussion with them, uh, get their, their inputs from some so what they see about the, the project, what is related to the swine industry, uh, an overview of the swine industry, the most of the challenges, and what is, the, is up to the, to the future to come. Before we get started, uh, Giovanni and Daniel would like the input from you guys about uh, this project. How do you guys... Uh, compared to what you guys think of when you when you start the project, how the project is today, and w what do you guys envision uh, for the future for the next 50 editions? Edson, it's a great pleasure to work on the Swine Disease Reporting System. And if you look for this project, it is an industry collaborative project that was developed to provide agent detection and disease diagnosis information for swine stakeholders to uh, manage take informed decisions and make interventions about diseases control, management, and interventions in the field. Uh, in the field, so this project is developed in collaboration with five different diagnostic laboratories, who really acknowledge and say thank you for the opportunity to work with all of them, and for the Health Information Center for providing funds for this project. The really value that it comes for the project and improvements comes from the contribution from the collaborators of this video, but and also from an advisory group that's composed for field veterinarians and producers that provide input to the project. And based on those inputs, we keep evolving and uh, developing new features for the project. As an mm -hmm. example, Influenza A was requested by this group, and now we are bringing the information about Influenza A PCR detection on this report. Yeah, so excited to be here, too, with the 50th edition. If we look back... Uh, we started in 2017 with a collaboration between two labs and one pathogen. In 50 editions, we are here. 50 editions later, we are here evolving from f two diagnostic labs to five diagnostic labs and from one pathogen to, um, to many others. And like Giovanni said, influenza is coming on board. PCV2 is also cooking, right? Spoiler alert there, <laughs> but it's, we're excited about that. And we're looking forward, we continue to keep evolving as the industry uh, request as the industry need, uh, uh, and that can be with another endemic ag agent that could be with emerging, that could be whatever uh, comes up. We're here to, to help and serve the industry uh, with this collaboration with these consortiums across the labs. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, guys. So, before we start with this special edition, Giovanni, uh, can you give us a little bit on overview of uh, what were the major highlights from in terms of PCR detection? Last month? Yeah, so during the last month, we saw a decrease in activity of PD. Just a reminder, PD was above expected since the end of January and mm -hmm. went through February and March. And now it's started to come down towards the expected level. So it seemed like the industry was able to develop some strategies to contain and now reduce the uh, pressure of infection of this agent in the field. In terms of PERS virus, the overall level of detection is within inspected, but we have seen some activity of this ver new variant, the lineage on C variant strain, more than it states on the west side of the thunderstorm that was in Iowa, Minnesota. Now we start to see more activity in, in Nebraska, South Carolina, and, and Missouri, so we may see some spike again in, during the summer months. And else we are doing very good in terms of TG. Nobody's talked about that because during the last year we did not have a single positive submission detected, even though we test more than 3,000 submissions every single month for this agent. And, and Giovanni, like you said, got to keep guards up, right, in terms of bi biosecurity for 
doesn't carry coronavir coronaviruses, but looking to PED, it was skyrocketing comparing to previous years, and now it's, like you said, coming back to to the expected level. So that said something about the soil industry, right, in terms of uh, rapid response to, to to what's going on with that agent, at least it's... Yeah, I totally agree with you, Daniel. If you look at January and February, it looks like we were losing the battle for PD because it was really going up. And But by providing real-time information about detection of this agent, I am pretty confident that helps the industry to have uh, enough information to take advantage of that and implement by containing by security measures to prevent the spread to additional market channels or additional uh, production systems and avoid a, a real a new very big increase in above control levels of PD detection. Thank you, Giovanni and Daniel, for the updates. So now we're gonna let you guys uh, let's watch the, together the this special edition that we prepare for you guys, the 50th edition. We're gonna have this discussion with the the four vets that we invited. So for this special edition, we're gonna have four questions for our guests. The first one. What were the major evolutions over the years in terms of purse control and elimination? And what is missing to really move the needle in this aspect? Well, unfortunately, we still have to uh, work at uh, control and elimination. Uh, I was hoping by the time we got to this time, we'd be uh, beyond that. But uh, purse still continues to circulate. And uh, unfortunately, the viruses that we have uh, today seem to be circulating a little bit longer. And I think. Um, some of the important things we found over time is that the herd closures do work. Uh, unfortunately, some are taking a little longer today, like we said. And uh, again, the work on regional control and understanding uh, what's going on in the grow finish, I think, is becoming an important piece and uh, was brought to light with the SDRS report uh, that the grow finish tends to lead the uh, cell farm outbreaks. And so it's been a helpful tool in being able to predict when it's going to start. Well, I, I'm going to answer th this question or these questions um, from my perspective as a diagnostician and a member of a, of a veterinary diagnostic lab, and in particular, in light of my role in molecular diagnostic testing, which comes down to really being PCR. And I think over the years, in terms of purse control and elimination, I think what's been impressive is the, the fact that we've been able to understand further what it really means to have PERS existing at an extremely low prevalence within production systems or populations down at the farm level that I think wasn't really understood before the, the research was conducted. And from that, um, what's been some major evolutions is the unique sample types that we've been able to incorporate into our diagnostic testing for PCR that have added so much benefit to surveillance. Probably oral fluids that we talk about a lot have been one of the most impactful but the processing fluids have been a uh, big influence as well. In addition to that though, uh, regarding molecular diagnostic tests, I think our PCR tests in general have become much more sensitive. So we're able to detect very small quantities of uh, the target in a sample. And I think we've made some strides on trying to discern between detection of wild type versus vaccine strains of PERS virus. And lastly, what I think would really move the needle in the aspect of PERS control and elimination is incorporating more whole genome sequencing and successful whole genome sequencing into our surveillance efforts and genetic monitoring. And I think we're starting to get there, but there is uh, definitely room for improvement and also to utilize that information much more effectively. Yeah, so I think certainly over the years, things have evolved as we learn more information about the virus and also as production systems evolve and have different demands that they need to meet. I think one of the things, at least for me, that has really changed over the years is the standard of thinking the regular, oh, it takes 20 weeks to eliminate PERS out of a sow herd. Um, I think the industry as a whole has really seen that that has, in some cases, doubled or tripled um, in time for what we actually really need to eliminate PERS out of a sow unit. 
um, that standard, you know, 20 weeks is really um, very far and few between that probably actually get it accomplished in um, that amount of time. And so I think the understanding that it's going to take us a lot longer if we truly choose to go down that path of we would like to eliminate it fully out of the herd. Um, the commitment and time to that is a lot longer. Um, and I think that's a major evolution of understanding the virus as well as understanding practices that help spread that virus um, throughout. And I think what's missing to really move the needle still is just a continued better understanding of what the individual animals shedding status is and what that pattern looks like, as well as also just an industry acceptance of that increase in duration of time and the impact that that has on production systems. Um, because there's clearly lots of production systems who uh, choose to live with it versus eliminate it. Um, and there is some financial impact that happens to systems who choose to eliminate it and especially living with that longer duration of time to elimination. Unfortunately, I've been working with PERS my entire career. So that evolution can, can go back um, 20 years. But the, the um, things that I think were the most pivotal in, what, in seeing PERS through those years was the first understanding um, that in order to control and eliminate um, PERS, it's all about the guilt. So first we started with trying to acclimate those guilts better, bringing the guilt in um, at a younger age instead of being select age into farms. We uh, changed our systems to bringing guilt in as wean, wean pigs and trying to perform an acclimation um, program. So if there was PERS at the farm, we could adequately acclimate them. And that kind of evolved into herd closure. So to eradicate PERS, the first step is um, to let it calm down in the farm. And, uh, and you know, long ago, we didn't really know how long that, uh, that needed to be. And over the years, we learned that through uh, processes of herd closure, some um, being unsuccessful at first. Um, next, uh, I think pivotal was understanding that those herd closures then were going to need to be longer. And so understanding where can we grow those gilts, having um, biosecure sites to have gilt availability once you open up the farm, uh, those then moved into breeding projects. So you have, uh, you don't miss your breeding targets and you can continue your performance and production at the farm while eliminating PERS. And then next was really pivotal in the testing side was processing fluids when the industry under, understood or, or uh, discovered that processing fluids was a very easy, really, really sensitive tool to monitor PERS on the farm and in the farrowing house and really understand um, using processing fluids where that transmission is occurring. So adding the testing at processing and then having wean pig testing, which we started doing uh, earlier than processing fluid testing, we understood when we were transmitting it um, in the in the wean pigs or from room to room, but then having two time points that were uh, allowed us to really narrow that down. And then last, I think understanding just the transmission and biosecurity aspects of PERS, PED uh, really helped us to understand um, about PERS as well, um, because PED is so visual when you have an infection or introduction of PED, you know really soon um, after it occurs, and that helped us to understand some of the gaps that we had in our biosecurity on the South Farm side. The second question is, looking in the rear view mirror, the industry learned a lot with the introduction of PD and the auto coronavirus in terms of biosecurity and biocontainment practice. What are the next low-hanging fruits to keep improving? That's a good question. In regards to molecular testing at the time, in particular, PED was introduced into the U.S. The diagnostic labs became very busy with a, a large number of samples that were required for diagnostic testing, both to diagnose and to monitor the presence of the virus in our production systems. And I think from the diagnostic lab perspective, we had to change some of our methods within the lab uh, stream of handling samples in order to reduce potential cross-contamination. And that actually occurred because we hadn't dealt with such strongly positive or hot positive, I would say, samples in the past like we did for PED. And so uh, that required some adjustments for how we handled the samples, 
some of our processes through getting those from sample to extraction to a PCR result, and then providing uh, a, a result to the, the veterinarian or client and their producer that they could trust. So I think in light of that and what was required within the diagnostic lab, I look further out beyond the lab walls, so to speak, and what's going on out in the industry. And from my perspective, I feel, still think that um, what we need to consider is more surveillance of the high-risk areas that are leading to transmission of the virus, which I still think is somewhat perplexing for a lot of us or veterinarians and the producers themselves who have very good biosecurity in place, but the virus still seems to move around. But um, in particular, with that comment, I think we still need to consider transportation of affected animals, uh, those transport vehicles as being a high-risk area. A lot of work is being done on feed to understand that further. And I think just other entities that may harbor the virus in particular, that, that are high-risk areas in particular, our slaughter plants where maybe the, the risk is still there for bringing those viruses back and somehow getting into our production system. So I think that there's some areas for improvement there. I hope that the industry continues to consider that and how surveillance through testing and then follow up cleaning disinfection will help improve our control of things like PED as well as Delta coronavirus out in the industry. Yeah, so I definitely myself have learned a lot uh, with PED and Delta and how we can move it across systems. I still think, to be honest, the market hauling and the feeder pig hauling is still very low hanging fruit that though we've identified it as an area that needs continuous improvement on, I don't know that we've really moved it yet um, to a level of confidence to say that, yeah, we can check that off the box and um, really have great biosecurity around market hauling. Um, and I would say, especially within systems that use a ton of third party hauling, um, where you don't necessarily have as much control over where they're washing, the quality of the wash, um, or depending on load crews to reject trailers that aren't washed appropriately. Um, so for at least my perspective and what I've seen today, I still think the market side of the live haul plus even feeder pig movements is a big area of opportunity, as well as um, decontamination of feed trucks. That seems to be, at least for us, ways that we continue to spread and uh, share disease um, between farms still. On a PED standpoint, we have a really good handle on PED um, status and um, level at the South Farm. And so most farms are either uh, eradicated PED when the South Farm gets in, uh, introduced or have a process of um, acclimation that's occurring for stability for PED. Um, so when it comes to, you know, risk areas or about security, I think the um, grow finish um, where we definitely have circulation that's a seasonal, um, this, the SR, uh, SDRS um, shows that so well that we have a seasonal component to grow finish PED and that's a risk to the south farm. And so until we really understand and can control the grow finish um, prevalence and incidence rates of PED, that's, that's going to be a risk to our south farms. We know that one of the biggest risks is transport. And so pigs have to move um, out of the south farm, they get weaned and the truck has to show up. And so until we get better and have those transport decontamination methods more accessible and um, get to the point where all of those uh, trucks are being decontaminated to the level that we have going on at the south farm, I feel that's going to continue to be a risk. Yeah, I think the, the biocontainment uh, concerns probably are one of those that are out there for us that I don't think the industry has focused on much in the past. We've been more about bioexclusion than biocontainment. And I think that uh, works for many of the diseases and something that we just have to make sure as an industry we work towards to, if we have an outbreak, to try and make sure we keep the virus, whichever virus we're talking about on that farm. In your opinion, what is the importance of analyzing swine diagnostic data along with others to support data-driven decisions? 
this is actually, I think, something that is really important. And with our system, we've started putting emphasis on our swine diagnostic data and putting it in different scorecards for us to see if we're making progress or losing ground um, when it comes to PERS, PED, and Delta. Um, really being able to have the evidence that tells you what is in your system, I think is really important because it can be easy to fall into that trap to say, well, I hear a sneeze, it must be flu, or I hear a late finishing cough, it must be myco. Um, so if you're not doing a good job of collecting uh, samples and getting appropriate samples to get good decision making out of it, um, you can really lead a system down the wrong path and chasing the wrong disease and spending the money in uh, wrong fashion that just doesn't get you anywhere. Um, and then you're not really getting the results that you're looking for. Um, and really it falls back to that you either weren't getting the right appropriate diagnostics or you weren't analyzing the information correctly with what was given. Um, so diagnostics are a great tool to help you go down the appropriate path and you know spend money appropriately, do the right treatments um, and get the results that your organization is really looking for you to get. So the importance of analyzing diagnostic data is really to make better decisions and to have a, a continuous improvement, improvement going on at the, at the farms. Um, you know, we often have a project or we, we sit down and we want to analyze historically our production data and we'll have data analytic teams. Um, uh, people at universities help us to do that, but, in, but really what I see is we need to be doing that um, going forward consistently and not just having that as a project, right? So continuously understanding that improvement or challenges on our system and utilizing the diagnostic data. So the swine industry, we have just a ton of diagnostic data. We do a lot of surveillance, both in the South Farm and Grow Finish. And uh, we've evolved over the years to, you know, rope sampling and, and PCR has uh, allowed us to understand those dynamics. But until we can get all of the data aggregated together and really use that day to day and not just historical, I think we're missing opportunity. And so this program helps us to do that, right? To collaborate different diagnostic labs and look at industry data um, collated. And I think that's really the key to um, the future for us to make better decisions. Another important aspect of analyzing swine diagnostic data is understanding that when we have um, endemic disease or um, a, a disease in the pigs such as PERS, we would have um, more antimicrobial use in those pigs. They get sick with um, other secondary bacterial diseases and we use more antibiotics. So one thing that we've learned in our system is as we eradicate diseases like PERS in our farms, we see a reduction in antimicrobial use. And I think that's also an important um, part of analyzing the data and understanding that elimination of disease is really going to have an impact on, on other things um, that are costly for your farm. I think they, um, they've been very helpful for us in being able to correlate that. For example, the SDRS report along with the uh, MSHAMP report, uh, there are two different uh, data data streams, uh, looking at different information. It's interesting to see how well they actually correlate. And so one's looking at the diagnostic data, one's looking at uh, reported incidents. And I think that helps to build confidence that we're understanding more about how these uh, pathogens are moving and uh, working through herds and understanding that through areas and populations. So again, I think it's very helpful to have that information uh, aggregated. Well, I think it would probably be fairly obvious that utilizing just one set of, of data within uh, production systems, whether it's production data or diagnostic data, that it would be difficult to make adequate decisions without considering more of the big picture. And I think that's true not only in out in the, the field, the industry or production systems, but true within our diagnostic lab as well. If I'm diagnosing a particular case, Diagnosing disease doesn't rely on one particular component of the diagnostic process. It's, it's looking at all the diagnostic data and combining it and correlating it back to the clinical impressions in order to establish what would be a quality diagnosis or one that we feel fairly confident that is true. And so 
we want our diagnostic data to align just like you would any other data you're considering within the swine industry, um, whether at the farm level or at the production system level, in order to make those uh, accurate decisions when moving forward with uh, any type of change that you might be making within the system itself. Um, in particular, what I think has become really important and necessary for a component of that diagnostic data is back to genetic sequencing. And it's been increasing over the years, and I think it's well understood the importance there. But if you don't understand what's circulating at the farmer production system level down to the genetics of the virus or even the bacteria, then you're not going to be able to really make uh, adequate decisions regarding what needs to be done next in order to uh, implement the strategies for controlling uh, those particular pathogens that are affecting the, the farm or the production system. So the genetic data is very important. It does get correlated back with other diagnostic data and would be important with other metadata that the farm can put around that. Again, so that the decisions that are made are just have, are economically sound and would have a, a much better chance of being impactful. So again, without that genetic data and sequencing, even along the lines of our bacteria now that are becoming more important and looking at particular genes that are uh, involved with um, virulence or something causing more uh, severe disease, it's just gonna be more difficult to be able to uh, make those decisions that are impactful to controlling disease at the farmer production system level. And the last question is, what could the swine industry do to improve surveillance and security against FAD? So um, using uh, surveillance data for security for foreign animal diseases. Well, we're all scared to death of foreign animal diseases. And, you know, every time I sit at a, at a meeting, I get reminded of um, how, how are we going to be better prepared? What are we doing to prepare? And, and we, we definitely have made progress in the last few years. Um, but we have we have more progress to make. Um, I think the um, the SHIP program, the Swine Health Improvement Program, um, that Dr. Main has uh, um, helped us understand the poultry side of of that type of program. I think that's going to be very helpful. Um, I'm excited to see the progress we've made on that. Rope testing for foreign animal diseases. The way that our industry is set up with um, you know, so many sites and so much, we're already doing so much surveillance, having a systematic surveillance method, um, as Dr. Main would say in peacetime, is uh, I think ultra important to have a basis. So when or if it does happen, we have some baseline surveillance going on, we have people trained. Uh, there's the new program with, um, uh, we can train some some of our farm staff and, and technical staff to help us um, uh, collect those samples. I think that's really, really important because uh, we've got to be able to survey more animals on a more frequent basis in the case of FAD. So that's getting us more prepared. And I'm excited for both of those programs and what we've done so far. And then the last one, of course, we need to continue to work on euthanasia methods um, for our farm on the sow farm side, especially PED, unfortunately, um, uh, taught us a lot about uh, mass euthanasia on young pigs, but we definitely have more work to do on the adult animal and south side. When we talk about the uh, FADs, uh, again, being a part of the, uh, the Swine Health Improvement Project, I think is one of the best things the industry can participate in that. Uh, that's going to help us to have a good organized system if we get to the point where we ever need to uh, use it. Also uh, participating in the secure pork supply and having some good mechanisms such as uh, the Ag View to be able to electronically uh, go back and look at those movements uh, in a relatively short period of time. I think those three tools are ones that we can use uh, to help us as we go in, if we ever have to go into an FAD type control program. Well, I think the, the question certainly is applicable today because of the concern with the FADs in particular, African swine fever, being relatively close to the US and impacting other countries. And currently we're dealing with highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, which might not impact the swine industry, but we can understand the impact it has on that particular industry and the, the detrimental effects that it can induce. And so controlling 
these diseases and the early detection would be probably the most critical thing we can do. So I think what the swine industry needs to really look at is aggressive active surveillance rather than just passive surveillance. What we currently do now in a diagnostic lab is associated with passive surveillance. Cases submitted to diagnose a particular problem or disease are also sent through for African swine fever and classical swine fever PCR testing. However, I think it's well known now that not always do these particular pathogens and others cause severe disease that's clinically noticeable. And so those viruses can harbor themselves in animals that are either affected by subtle clinical signs or are not clinically affected. And thus the concern there would be obviously that we're gonna miss those pathogens in those situations. So considering the active surveillance in addition to passive surveillance could make a big difference. And of course we need approval to use our aggregate sample types for those surveillance type of programs, which would be oral fluid, processing fluid, things of that nature that I think are well supported from the research that's been done on our endemic pathogens that would also help to monitor for early detection of the virus. And if it were to enter the US, those would be critical to help us in the elimination and control in that effort as well. Yeah, so I think this is a good question and I think it can be answered a couple of different ways. One, I think we also need to remember that the swine industry is more than just your large packers or producers. It's also people who have swine at home, people who are showing swine. All of those people are still part of the swine industry, though they might have a different role in it. So I think part of really improving ourselves against FADs is also making sure that we're educating all of the swine industry, not just our big producer partners and our packers and those people, but really also getting the people who have 4-H pigs, who have show pigs, um, because those people are also going to be impacted by an FAD that comes to the United States. And if they're not well informed um, or prepared, where the our industry, where we are large producer partners or packers, we're also going to suffer from that. So I think that is a really important piece is making sure that everyone has the same level of education on FADs across the industry. And then I also think doing more active surveillance rather than just oh we see an issue no so now we need to go do surveillance um you know it'll it'll always be reactive if we're always doing it that way we're always just reacting to the problem that we have at hand we're not trying to prevent the problem from becoming a larger problem or um you know problem that now affects multiple people where if we were more actively looking for it it might have only affected one small region especially with how much we move pigs today. So that was it. I hope you guys have enjoyed this discussion. Uh, we are very happy to celebrate here uh, the 50th edition of the SDRS. Like Daniel and Giovanni mentioned, how this pro project started and uh, what we, we, the evolutions that we had and the more looking forward to see what is, what is coming in the next 50 editions. Thank you. I hope to see you guys next month.